Okay, in this video we're going to talk about atoms and elements. So all matter is composed of elements, and these are substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by ordinary chemical methods. So, you know, elements are essentially atoms. And the four elements that make up 96% of our bodies include carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. So really you only need these four elements to make 96% of a human. Otherwise, there's an additional nine that make up about 4% and then an additional 11 that are more trace amounts, you know, 0.01% uh, of your body weight. Now, <clears throat> the periodic table lists all the known elements. However, you know, you don't find all of these elements in a human body. So we'll just talk about those ones that are more relevant to our own biology. So all elements are made up of atoms, and these atoms are the unique building blocks for each element. Now, <clears throat> the smallest particles of an element uh, that have properties of that element, that's what an atom is, and they also give what each element its particular physical and chemical properties. So the atomic symbol is like a one or two letter chemical shorthand for each element. An example of this would be O for oxygen or C for carbon. Uh, it's just a shorthand symbol for these particular elements. Uh, some symbols are a little different. Uh, than the words we used to call them because they're derived from their Latin names. So for sodium, that's actually Na, and this comes from the Latin natrium. And for potassium, we, de we denote this as K, which is the Latin calium. Now, uh, what these next tables show is if effectively the uh, elements uh, in our body that are <clears throat> in descending order of our body mass. And so what we find is that the most... Uh, at least abundant atom that it contributes at least the most to our body mass here is oxygen. You know, and you can think about this because our body is mostly water, and because oxygen is the heaviest atom in a water molecule, uh, this is partly partly why it explains you know such a large component of our body mass. So 65% of our body's mass is oxygen. Now, oxygen is a component of both organic, which are carbon containing, and inorganic or non-carbon containing molecules. And as a gas, O2 is necessary for the production of ATP by our body's cells. Now, carbon, denoted as C, accounts for approximately 18.5% of our body weight. And it's a component of all organic molecules. You know, this is what we say an organic molecule is one which contains carbon. And this also includes the, the major biomolecules like carbohydrates, lipids, which include fats and oils, proteins and nucleic acids, these are all carbon-containing molecules, which are the biomolecules that make up a human body. Now, hydrogen is in approximately 9.5% of our body weight, and it's so abundant because this is a major component of organic molecules. Um, hydrogen ions, the proton itself, actually influences our blood pH. So when you talk about uh, the pH of your blood and body fluids or acidity, it relates to the concentration of hydrogen ions in that solution. And nitrogen, or denoted as N, uh, accounts for about 3.2% of our body weight. And it's a component of protein and nucleic acids, which is a genetic material. So uh, nitrogenous uh, molecules, so molecules that have a lot of nitrogen, uh, include proteins and nucleic acids. Now calcium, denoted as Ca, is a salt that you find within bones and teeth. Uh, in its ionic state, Ca2+, it's required for muscle contraction, nerve impulses, and blood clotting. So calcium is an extremely important uh, atom in our particular body because it's, uh, it's involved with structure and cell signaling and blood clotting. Now phosphorus, denoted as P, accounts for about 1% of or so of our body weight. And uh, in part, this forms calcium phosphate salts in bones and teeth. But it's also present in nucleic acids, and it plays a role in ATP. So we need to have enough phosphorus um, in our bodies to make a sufficient amount of ATP to keep our cells alive. Now, potassium, uh, also den you know, den for the Latin calium, is denoted as K. This is about 0.4% of our body mass. In its ionic state, it's necessary for conduction of nerve impulses and muscle contractions. Sulfur, or S here, uh, as a component of proteins and muscle proteins. Sodium, denoted as Na because of the Latin natrium, uh, only accounts for about 0.2% of our body mass. However, it's a very important ion because you find this uh, outside of most cells. It's important in water balance, so when you want to maintain adequate water levels in your body, uh, sodium regulation is often um, you know, 
uh, plays a role there. And it also plays a role in the conduction of nerve impulses and muscle contraction. So later on in AMP1, we'll talk about how sodium plays a role in uh, how neurons or nerve cells communicate and how muscles also contract. Chlorine, denoted as CL, uh, is the most abundant negative ion, also in extracellular fluids. This also plays a role in cell signaling, and we'll get to this later on in AMP1. In magnesium, Mg, it's present in bone, but it's also an important cofactor in the number of metabolic reactions. In fact, you find magnesium paired with ATP, because it actually helps to stabilize ATP. Uh, magnesium is also important in cell signaling within the brain. Iodine, it's needed to make thyroid hormone. So although it only accounts for 0.1% of our body mass, we need enough iodine to make thyroid hormone to regulate the metabolism of our body. So it's also a very important ion or atom here. And then iron, denoted as Fe, is a component of hemoglobin, which is necessary for the transportation of things like oxygen and carbon dioxide within red blood cells. And it's also a necessary cofactor for some enzymes as well. So we need enough iron in our diet and also in order to uh, have adequate homeostasis. Uh, other trace elements you might find in your body as well are things like chromium, cobalt, copper, fluorine, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, silicon, tin, vanadium, and zinc. So these are considered trace elements because they're required but in very minute amounts. So many are found as part of enzymes or they're required for enzyme action. Um, so you know, these are sort of trace types of atoms we, our body needs. Now, in terms of the structure of an atom, uh, they're really, you can break this down into three major parts. We got protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons always carry a positive charge, and uh, we actually give it the uh, atomic mass unit of one AMU. So we can talk about how many protons there are in an atom, and that can actually give us an idea of how heavy that atom can be. However, we also have neutrons. So some atoms, uh, most atoms also have neutrons. And these neutrons have no electrical charge, hence the name, neutron, because it's neutral. They also weigh approximately one atomic mass unit. So if you had an atom with one proton and one neutron, then it would have an atomic mass of about two or so. Uh, electrons carry a negative charge, and they're so tiny they virtually have no weight. So we could round their weight up to zero and just say that they don't have a weight. Um, their mass is measurable with very precise experiments and uh, instrumentation. But, uh, you know, as far as we're concerned here, we'll just say that electrons are massless. Now, the number of positive protons is balanced by a number of negative electrons. So in order for atoms to be, have a balanced charge, we say that their number of protons should equal the number of electrons and therefore would be electrically neutral. When atoms have an unequal number of protons versus electrons, that's when they have a charge, and that's when we would call that atom or molecule an ion, which is, uh, can be either positively or negatively charged. Now, protons and neutrons. These are the, actually the, uh, the subatomic particles that are located within the nucleus. These make up the nucleus, and nucleus translates as kernel. And uh, they actually have an orbit of electrons. So the electrons, which are effectively massless, uh, actually orbit this nucleus made of protons and neutrons. Now, chemists have divided different models of how subatomic particles are put together. And we can look at this in a variety of ways, like planetary or orbital models. So over here is showing the planetary model. You can see we have a nucleus here. And it looks like <clears throat> there are orbiting bodies around a planet. So this is the planetary model here. Now this is showing the orbital model which is more uh, correct because uh, electrons don't really just orbit in one plane or one circle around a nucleus. In reality they actually have these uh, electron orbital shells and the electrons can be really anywhere along this sort of hazy zone here. So instead of, we, instead of us saying that we know for sure that an electron is right here at this point, we say that it's statistically likely to be in this particular zone or range, which is the orbital model here. Now what we're comparing then is two different helium atoms, and helium is the um, second <coughs> uh, element on the periodic table. It's made of two protons and two neutrons, and when it's in a balanced state, it's got two electrons. So remember the protons are showing in red here. They don't really have a color, but they're showing as red. These would carry a positive charge. The neutrons uh, shown in yellow here would be neutrally charged. And because we have two electrons, each one contains or carries a negative charge. This is a balanced atom because the two positives and two negatives cancel out. Uh, and really just seeing two different ways of showing the same uh, type of atom. 
Now, uh, elements will differ depending on the number of subatomic particles. So hydrogen, which is the first uh, element on the periodic table, has one proton, has no neutrons in its most common form, and one electron. So that's just that's hydrogen right there. And actually, hydrogen is the most abundant element in our universe. Uh, helium has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. And, and because it's got two protons, we say it's the second uh, you know, element in the periodic table. Lithium's got three protons, but four neutrons and three electrons. So it's going to have an odd sort of molecular mass here, right? Or actually, atomic mass, rather, because you're going to have three protons, which have one atomic unit each, four neutrons, which actually have one atomic unit each. So lithium has an atomic mass of seven, but it's the third element. So you can't just look at the number of protons to know how heavy a particular element is. You really got to talk about how many of the protons and neutrons exist in that particular atom or element. So uh, in terms of identifying facts about an element, you want to talk about its atomic number, and that tells us about the number of protons. Its mass number, and that tells us about the number of protons and neutrons, and because each one weighs one, that gives us a particular mass, as well as isotopes. So isotopes refer to the varying forms of a particular type of atom. So what we see here then is just comparing the different types of atoms we just talked about. How hydrogen's got one proton and one electron, so it's balanced. Helium has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. And lithium, which is the third element, has three protons, four neutrons, and three electrons. So these are actually all balanced. So none of these would carry any net charge. But in terms of atomic mass, hydrogen would be one, helium would be about four, and lithium would be about seven. Now, atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. And we write this as sort of a smaller number as a subscript next to our uh, atomic symbol. So we say that lithium is atomic number three. And mass number refers to the total number of protons and neutron neutrons in the nucleus. So this gives us an idea of the total mass of that atom. And it's written as a superscript uh, next to the uh, atomic symbol here. So we see that lithium, which is the third element, has an atomic mass of seven because you have three protons and four neutrons. Now, isotopes are those who have structural variations of the same element, and these atoms contain the same number of protons, but can differ in their neutron number. And so what we say then is that their atomic numbers are the same, but the mass numbers can be different. So an example of this is heavy hydrogen. It's possible to have hydrogen with a neutron. So it's, it, that means that instead of having a hydrogen atom with an atomic mass of one, you can have heavy hydrogen with an atomic mass of two. And that would actually be an isotope, which is a variant of the more common form of that atom. And atomic weight is really just the average mass of the numbers of all isotopic forms of that particular atom. So you talk about all the isotopes or all the different forms of an atom that exists in our nature, in our world. Uh, if you take their average, then that would give you their atomic weight on the periodic table. So this is showing an example of isotopes. So hydrogen here um, in its more common form is one proton, one electron. Deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, is one proton, one neutron, and one electron. So this would actually have a mass number of two. And then tritium, which is one proton and two neutrons, would have um, a mass number of three because of its extra subatomic particles here. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting too is that a lot of times isotopes will decompose into more stable forms. So that some isotopes aren't as stable as other types of atoms or isotopic forms. And as these atoms lose various particles from their nucleus or electrons, we, this can actually lead to a different element. So as isotopes decay, subatomic particles that are given off release a little bit of energy. This is re referred to as uh, radioactivity, and it can actually can be detected with scanners. So radioisotopes are a valuable tool for biological research in medicine because they can share a lot of the same chemistry as stable isotopes and be, can be taken up by the body, and this can be used for things like diagnosis and disease. So some types of medical imaging use radioisotopes to see tissues better, um, and we actually can use radioisotopes to kill uh, you know, cancerous cells and that kind of stuff. Now, all radioactivity can damage living tissues. So some types can be used to destroy local cancers, like with thyroid cancers, we can administer radioactive iodine, which actually degrades into one of the uh, noble gases. Um, and some types cause cancer. Things like radon from uranium decay are uh, one of the more common causes of lung cancer.